The refuge there, they say, may hold two to four billion uh, barrels of oil that we might get someday when, from extraction process at who knows what cost to the refuge, to the Gwich'in, to the caribou, to the ecosystem there. Several months worth of our petroleum. Is it worth spoiling a place like that for several more months of petroleum when we have so much yet to do in terms of efficiencies and mass transit and other ways of, of living less on the petroleum and more in tune with the planet? So we try everywhere we go to see what are the connections between our lifestyles, our choices, and the well-being of the creation as well as the people who are living in these places. The Jesus way. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. Is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. Is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. When He is King, all wars will cease. May His peace begin with me. I'm gonna beat my sword. Gonna beat my sword into a plow. Into a plow. Gonna beat my sword. Gonna beat my into a plow, into a plow. Gonna, gonna beat my sword into a plow. Christ is king in my life now. May his peace begin with me. According to David Radcliffe, director of the New Community Project, caring for this amazing but endangered creation we call Earth is the challenge of our lifetime. He believes that every one of Earth's systems is in trouble the systems that keep the planet going and the people safe. The climate continues to get warmer. Half of all Earth's wetlands are gone. Species extinction is accelerating and reaching epidemic proportions. And only half of Earth's tropical forests remain. Recently, we also learned that half of the coral in the Great Barrier Reef of Australia has vanished due to global warming. People who know about these things say we are making changes that will be with the planet and its peoples for generations and maybe millennia to come. Hello, this is Brent Carlson. Welcome to Brethren Voices. We made a trip to Arctic Village, Alaska, which is 100 miles north of the Arctic Circle with a new community project learning tour. They have a relationship with Arctic Village, which has developed over the last 10 wonderful years. We visited with friends in this community of the native Gwich'in tribe. The Gwich'in people of Alaska and Canada have lived off the land in this area for over 10,000 years and are dependent on caribou for their existence. We traveled to continue our learning of the plight of the Gwich'in people as they deal with the climate change and the threat of the possibility of oil drilling in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge and the effect that that would have on their culture. We learned that it's not only an environmental issue, but also an issue affecting their human rights and livelihood. We had an opportunity to meet with David Radcliffe, director of the New Community Project, while up on a mountain overlooking the magnificent and wonderful Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. David, I understand this is about the 10th anniversary of your coming to Arctic Village. Can you tell us a little bit about Arctic Village and how you started bringing people here? Sure. Uh, yeah, we started coming to Arctic Village in 2002. Um, I first met some Gwich'in Indian leaders at a National Council of Churches meeting down in Washington, D.C., and then in another setting, and they were talking about their concerns for the possibility of oil drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, they are concerned for several reasons, uh, one of which is environmental and what it will do to that pristine wilderness area, but also uh, the Gwich'in very much have been dependent on the porcupine caribou herd for thousands of years for their sustenance, and the porcupine caribou herd goes to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to give birth uh, in late May and early June every year, migrate up there from the southern part uh, 
from the well from this parts of Alaska and other parts of Canada and then have their birthing process there and are there for a few weeks or a couple of months and then head back south past the Gwich'in communities. So the Gwich'in see it both as an environmental issue and as a, a deeply cultural issue for them, whether or not they'd be drilling there and what effect the drilling would have on the porcupine herd. In fact, they see it as, they call it a human rights issue. Uh, their culture and their historic way of life uh, in jeopardy uh, thanks to the possibility of oil drilling. So that was one reason we came here. Another one is we're just very interested in the situation of indigenous people wherever they are in the world. Uh, they're often the ones who've been overrun, had their lands overrun, their cultures overrun, societies overrun, populations in decline for various factors. So they're some of the most vulnerable people on the planet. Um, and so we have a special affinity for trying to f learn about these cultures and support them and sort of stand by them in any way we can as they try to continue to survive uh, and hold in trust for us a great wealth of knowledge about places like this, but also wherever they are around the world. Um, so that was another reason we came. And then um, also a friend of mine had been here before um, and told me it was one of the most beautiful places he'd ever seen. And so part of the reason, one other reason to come here is just it's a, an amazing biodiverse uh, ecosystem that a lot of people have not had the chance to visit. And uh, we thought it would be kind of inspiring for people to come here, plus very educational to learn about the Gwich'in, their culture, their concerns about the drilling in the refuge, and what they have to share with us, what we can learn from them, as well as whatever we may share with them. Arctic Village is an unusual place to come. There's no roads, there's no restaurants, there's no hotels, unless you knew somebody virtually accessible. So how did you first get access to the Arctic Village? Well, it is the most remote human settlement in the Western Hemisphere. So we take some small amount of pride in bringing people to this remote outpost of human civilization. Uh, after meeting the Gwich'in people there at the uh, Trimble Gilbert and other representatives at the National Council of Churches meeting and another meeting, uh, I asked them about contact people. They put me in touch with someone in the village who then put me in touch with Charlie Sweeney and his wife Marion, and uh, they agreed to host our first delegation back in 2002. And so um, we arrived here hoping there'd be someone at the small airstrip to meet us, and sure enough, Charlie was there. And so they've been our hosts and our guides ever since that time. And what do you do when you come to Arctic Village? Well, we just try as much as possible to experience life here above the Arctic Circle, uh, to talk with the Gwich'in community, whoever of them has time and, and interest in speaking with us, to learn about their own traditions, their culture, uh, the way their daily life goes on. And then we come out into the wild, so to speak. Uh, we're cooking over a campfire over there. We slept in tents around through the area here, up on the mountainside here where we are. We took a long hike yesterday out to see a, an impressive, huge fishing lake, Old John Lake. Uh, that's sort of a, an, an important landmark for the Gwich'in, as well as a supply of fish and food. Um, and then we head up the river uh, to see that part of Gwich'in life, um, going up to a fish camp. We hope to see some moose along the way. You never know. Um, that's one of the animals the Gwich'in hunt, along with the caribou. Uh, we'll certainly hopefully catch lots of fish. And if we're extremely lucky, a cross paths with a couple of musk, musk ox or something. Uh, these creatures, these almost prehistoric creatures, make their way into this area sometimes. We've seen their tracks before, but never seen them. So we are just trying to experience life as it is here in this community with these people uh, to learn about that and also how it can inform us for how to live within the rhythms of nature uh, and with the planet as, and the creation as God has created it without uh, leaving a big footprint. Have you had any special experiences or interesting things happen on your tours to Arctic Village? Well, I guess one of the most, uh, most interesting things that ever happened to us was actually on the mountain just off to our left here. Uh, we were on the hike to Old John Lake and arrived there after a couple of hours and had our lunch on a, a vantage point overlooking the lake several four or five miles away. And uh, as we're finishing up our lunch and taking our group photos, uh, one of our folks said, you know, I think I see a grizz and pointed down into the plateau below us. Well, it turns out it was a caribou. And the young Gwich'in man, Danny Gemmel, who was uh, our guide and kind of accompanying us on this hike, just told us to stay, stay put and keep quiet. And we could see him stalking this caribou down on the plain in front of us. It was an amazing just panoramic view of the Gwich'in hunt in progress. 
He eventually uh, shot the caribou. We all ran down. I mean, we had vegetarians in the group. They were excited. Uh, this is Gwich'in life. So we ran down, and, and there the animal was, and some people began to help him begin to skin it and get it ready for t transport down to the village. And as that process was nearing completion, uh, someone said, looking in the valley below, I think I see four more. And four more caribou came into view. Danny again said, you guys stay there, be quiet. Went ahead a little ways, took a bead on the first animal, on the move, about a quarter of a mile away, and got it. Then got the other three. Well, someone had asked Danny on the way up the mountain that day how many caribou his family needed for the winter. He and his wife and two children. He'd said five. And he had five in one morning's outing. It was a remarkable experience for him, of course, for us, because outsiders rarely see these things. It's only as you come here and, and are here repeatedly and stay longer that you have the opportunity to experience things like this. So he took the animals well, on the four-wheelers down to the village that evening late. Uh, the next morning, some of our folks went over and uh, were helping cut it up into freezer-sized chunks and that sort of thing. And they reported a strange thing, actually. People from the village all began showing up to congratulate Danny on a remarkable outing. Everybody got a piece of the meat to take home. So even though that was what he needed for he and his family, it was never just for them alone. And to me, that was just a remarkable experience of, of the skill of a hunter, but also the generosity and hospitality that's part of the Gwich'in community here. I've heard that 75% of the diet of the Gwich'in people is from the land. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about their survival and, and how long they've lived in this way and a little bit about the history of the village? Well, the Gwich'in say they've lived here forever. Uh, they don't buy into the land bridge theory. Their, their, own, their own theory and their own belief is that they were created here to be a part of this land, to care for the caribou as well as to gain sustenance from the caribou. So we might say they've been here forever, either as a figure of speech or literally, um, and have lived this way for thousands of years. Now, of course, they're in a more settled community now, and they have a school and a post office and those kinds of things, but they still are very much attached to and attuned to the land around them. And so they hunt the caribou, they hunt moose, they trap ground squirrels, uh, they fish from the rivers, they shoot ducks from the skies. Uh, there's various... Uh, plants that they use for food, and so they're very much uh, dependent on uh, the land around them. Some of this is by necessity. Uh, getting food here to this small community is quite an enterprise and very expensive. So a small can of beans may cost several dollars, uh, and so you can't really afford to live off the, the store here in the community, but also not just for economic reasons, but also for spiritual and cultural reasons, uh, they want to stay attached to the land around them. I think partly because they see that the way the rest of us live may be a bit tenuous in the long run. And I think they want to feel like if push comes to shove, the worst thing happens in our world and some things begin to come apart, they still have the land, they'll still be able to provide for them and their community. Their community and their land is a part of their culture. And it's not like there's a separation between one and the other, it, it's they're together. It's at the core of their being. In fact, Sarah James, Gwich'in, Gwich'in leader, says um, the caribou and they were created at, by the creator kind of at the same time, very in, in the same, out of the same substance and, and brought into being at the same time. So their, their, their destinies, their, his, their, I guess you say their heritage as well as their destiny, destinies are inextricably linked um, with the land, with the caribou, and with this way of life. You bring many people to Arctic Village on your learning tours. What are the people like who come here? <laughs> well, we have all kinds, of course. We take anyone who wants to come. Typically, they have very, a real interest in adventure because this is an adventurous trip that we're on. Uh, perhaps the most seat of our pants trip that we offer as New Community Project. Other places we go in the world, we have partners there who are planning our trip to every detail and transportation is arranged and the weather's not nearly the factor as it is here where we're out in the environment. And so we need people who have a, a willingness to be flexible, uh, to kind of go with the flow as 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 uh, the Gwich'in are sometimes on their own time schedule, and for good reason often, because they don't know when the spare part's gonna come to fix the boat, or they don't know what the weather's gonna hold, and so we have to be flexible to go with how the plan unfolds before us, and we have to be ready to live in a bit of, I won't say extremity, but in a very basic living condition. Uh, you're camping, you're eating off food cooked off the fire, you're getting your water from the creek over to the side here, um, 
So we need people with um, a, a kind of a taste for adventure, um, a willingness to live a little bit on the on the sim simple side of things, and also, of course, probably most importantly, people who are going to respect the Gwich'in and come here to, to learn from them and to try to gain a deeper understanding and to build a relationship with them. And typically, when they go home, when our people go home from here, back to the lower 48, uh, Charlie and Mary and our host want to stay in touch with them and do with many of them for years to come. So it means something to the community here that we come, that we listen, that we learn, that we build relationships. And I think it also means something to our people to come, to listen, to learn, to build relationships, both with the people in our groups, because camping out like this together for a week on the tundra, it does bind you together, as well as building a relationship with the community that we've uh, been visiting. You spoke of some other learning tours. Where else does New Community Project take people? Uh, we have several places that we go on a regular basis, uh, two of them in Asia, South Asia, one in uh, Nepal, where we focus on women's issues uh, and the poverty and those kinds of issues there, as well as, of course, you're in the shadow of the Himalaya, and we do a bit of trekking, and it's just an amazing place to be. In Southeast Asia, we go to Myanmar, or some say Burma, uh, where we're learning about the political situation, the economics, the poverty, uh, especially the needs of women and children, and visiting both hill tribe communities and down into the Delta area uh, to visit two different sectors of Burmese society, and in the meantime, having conversations about the dynamics of uh, Burmese history and culture and politics. Um, and then we head to Africa for one of our trips. We go to South Sudan. Uh, I've been taking groups there either through NCP or another uh, church organization I worked with for about 20 years. Um, and so we go to South Sudan to, again, learn about the situation, the history, the politics, the warfare, the warfare that's been going on on and off for most of those 20 years that I've been going there and the new possibilities for peace now that the peace accords have been signed and South Sudan is its own nation. We also focus there on women, children, reforestation, visit communities where these things are in place. We also take a trip every year to Central America or the Caribbean, from Guatemala to Honduras to El Salvador to the Dominican Republic, uh, where we're again dealing with poverty issues, women's concerns, uh, the history of U.S. involvement in these countries, which has been very direct and very uh, impactful and not always in a good way of our nation's role there. We also take a trip further south then in, the, in this hemisphere to the Ecuadorian Amazon, where we experience the beauty and vitality of the rainforest, uh, learn to know something about native traditions there, the culture and, and, and traditions of the native communities there, but also see the impacts on the rainforest from the oil drilling to the deforestation to the effects of climate change, uh, and try to see how our lives are connected with what's going on there. In fact, we try to do that everywhere we go. How do these the things that are happening there, how is our world connected to their world? Whether it's the clothes we wear or the climate we're changing or the wars we fight or the economic policies we purvey upon the world. And then when we get home, how can we live more responsibly in relation to those things? Which brings us back around to the Arctic for a moment. The refuge there, they say, may hold two to four billion uh, barrels of oil that we might get someday when, from extraction process at who knows what cost to the refuge, to the Gwich'in, to the caribou, to the ecosystem there. Several months worth of our petroleum. Is it worth spoiling a place like that for several more months of petroleum when we have so much yet to do in terms of efficiencies and mass transit and other ways of, of living less on the petroleum and more in tune with the planet? So we try everywhere we go to see what are the connections between our lifestyles, our choices, and the well-being of the creation as well as the people who are living in these places. When you talk about Miramar and Nepal and... El Salvador and many of those, South Sudan, certainly. The United States has had some involvement in those places, mm -hmm. and those are all politically active. Mm -hmm. well, how do the native, natural, indigenous people who live there feel about uh, foreigners coming to their country? That's a very interesting question. We have found, almost without exception, people to be hospitable, welcoming, generous, gracious, you know, wishing, glad we were there, and seem to be very happy that we're there. They be, they're able to make a distinction between 
U.S. citizens and people in groups like ours who come to visit and the policies of our government and the corporations. Now, I'm not sure we don't have some responsibility, frankly, for our politics, our economics, our corporations. I feel like maybe they should hold us more accountable, but they're very gracious to us. And so almost without, without exception, people there are, are gracious. And, I mean, I was in Iraq in 2001, and even there with war looming, the U.S. breathing down their neck, the people very gracious to our visiting delegation. They said, one of the persons we spoke with there said, you know, I am a person, you are a person. It's our governments that can't get along. And so people are able to make that distinction, which I think I'm not sure we deserve, but they do make that distinction, welcome us. And I think anyone who goes into these communities with the right attitude, not the attitude that here, let us show you how to do this, or let us teach you the things we know, or, or here, uh, here's what you really need to make a successful life, but to go in with an open heart, open hand, open spirit, to learn as well as to share, uh, and to be humble in the process and to realize money is not the whole game here. They have much to offer us. It's not always of an economic value, although the cup of cold water or a, a piece of some stew fixed for you over the campfire here, that is, does have real, real substance and real value to it. But they have a lot to offer us in terms of resilience and hospitality and community, things that we sometimes are a little short on. And so I think if you go with an attitude of wanting to receive those gifts that they have to offer us, as well as give whatever we have to share. Uh, people on the whole are, are, are welcoming and, and are glad you have come. One of our, one of our most important programs uh, we call Give a Girl a Chance, which is um, basically supporting our partners in several parts of the world to help young women get an education. I think one of the most important things for the health and vitality of communities and societies, as well as families and human beings around the world, is for young women to have the opportunity that's often denied them to have a decent chance for a decent life. Uh, in Nepal, for instance, they have a saying, to be born a daughter is a lost life. And girls there on the bottom end of every rat ladder you can think of, um, and often are sold off into sexual or other kind of labor slavery as young as 12, 14 years old, because their lives are of so little value really to their families, and they can bring a few dollars by sending them off to work in some other country. So... Um, we're trying to reverse that trend in our own small way. Uh, we're supporting probably about 250 girls around the world uh, in Sudan, in South Sudan, uh, in Burma, in Nepal, currently are the places we're providing scholarships uh, through our partners in these places to help these girls have a chance to get the education they need to have the life that they deserve. And so getting an education almost always means fewer children, healthier children, more opportunities for the young woman and her family then. She can become economically active in ways that aren't dangerous or demeaning, which is often what women are left with, and also then it could be a contributor to her family, to her community, and a leader in her, in her, her community and, and society. Uh, 
Uh, funding for Give a Girl a Chance comes primarily from individual donors. Uh, there are certainly congregations, some school groups, some others that give us money. Um, but um, we bring in probably about forty-five dollars or $50,000 a year for Give a Girl a Chance. I think one of the unique things about our organization is we pass all of that through to our partners for these programs. Um, we fund our general programs, our learning tours, my own support, the other materials we have, our website, all those things uh, through contributions to the general program. Anything that comes in for Give a Girl a Chance or our other main fund, If a Tree Falls, which is for reforestation and forest preservation, we send 100% of that onto the programs themselves. And there, the people there are working in a very lean way to make the programs happen, often volunteering their own time. And so we feel like um, the money really goes where the donor intends it to go. So uh, that's how it happens. And uh, people, I think if they see there's a need and things are then done responsibly, um, they feel like they want to support that. And we've been very grateful to the people who have responded generously and, and the communities that have responded generously to help these programs go. One young woman, she said, you know, I'd been sent away. This was from South Sudan during the war years, had to flee Sudan to Uganda as a 12, 13-year-old, ended up getting married in a refugee displaced persons camp there, had a child or two by the time she was 16 or 17. Then the husband left her. The war was over. She came back to South Sudan. No way to get the education that she really wanted. Even with these two children, she had a, just a burning desire to go back to school. And then she said, you know, I met Agnes which is our partner there. I met Agnes. She told me about this Give a Girl a Chance program. I arranged, I took a, I made an application. I got this scholarship. Now I'm back in school, helping myself improve myself, improving my life for my children, and I'm just supporting them by myself. But I'm so grateful. And just stories like that that are plentiful, really, of these young, young women who are deeply, deeply grateful for the opportunity they have to do something they maybe never dreamed they'd be able to do. David, thank you for sharing wonderful experiences with us and thank you for what you do with New Community Project and thank you for taking people who never have a chance to go and visit and meet and be with people around the world who are uh, so close to the earth. Thank you for sharing with us and thank you for being with us on Brethren Voices. My privilege and my pleasure and uh, thank you for all you folks do. You're very welcome. We, we couldn't do it without people like you. <laughs> so north of the Arctic Circle above a small village called Arctic Village. This is Brent Carlson for Brethren Voices, wishing you peace. Oh, the Jesus way, oh, the Jesus way is, the way of peace. is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way, oh, the Jesus way is, the way of peace. is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. When he is king, all wars will cease. May his peace begin with me. I'm gonna beat my sword into a plow. Gonna beat my sword. To make better choices, to look more broadly, to live more responsibly, and to see how we together, because we're all in this together, we in the United States tend to think we're above the fray. We are not above the fray. Whether it's climate change, or whether it's conflict, or whether it's economic trends going on around the world, or whether it's the long-term trend toward justice in this world, we are not above the fray or above reproach in terms of the, some of this coming back on us. And so in a, you know, even in a self-centered way, as well as in a, you might say, other-centered or a compassionate way or a justice-minded way, we need to be paying attention to the world we live in.